Hi, well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and I would like to say happy um, Bats Appreciation Day. I am super excited to have Dr. Aaron Gorkoran today uh, to talk about his research on bats um, to celebrate today. Um, so Dr. Gorkaran aims to connect uh, the dots to life in the natural world uh, relating to how animal um, bodies works to how animals behave and interact in, in nature. Um, his research on bats and moss has been highlighted in media around the world. Um, he has also served as a scientific consultant for the National Geographic uh, while filming a segment for the natural documentary on Unmated Americas and AIM, a National Geographic Explorer. Uh, his research on bats and moths has taken him across the country, often at the Southwest Research Station and to Ecuador. Um, he has worked in several research labs for graduates and postdoctoral research, including Dr. Joe um, Swash, I'm sorry, I can't say this, uh, Swashkitz at Humboldt State University, uh, Dr. William Connor um, at uh, Wake Forest, uh, the Arbitrary uh, Neuro Neuroethological Lab um, of Dr. Cindy Moss at the University of Maryland, um, now at Johns Hopkins and Ty uh, Hedricks at UNC uh, Chapel Hills. He started the Sensory and uh, Movement Ecological Research Lab at UC Colorado Springs in fall of uh, 2019. Um, he has given dozens of talks on research, on his research and other topics uh, to young, general, and scientific audiences. And he always is happy to share his work with others. Uh, he, he believes that multimedia and storytellings are some of the best tools for communicating science. Um, he uses bats and moths as a model for systems for, in, in, for integrating the disciplines of animal behavior, sensory, physiology, uh, bio, uh, biomechanics, uh, ecological, ecology, ecology, and evolution. Um, this often involves using technologies, including high-speed infrared uh, videography, um, ultrasound recording, custom electronics, computer programming, and computer modeling. And with that, I will um, give the floor to Dr. Gorkona. Thank you for the warm introduction there, Anita. And thank you everyone who's joining us in real time or later on uh, watching this recording. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about uh, the research that I've been doing uh, mostly for, uh, myself, but some other work as well over about the last 20 years this is my 20 year anniversary of, of studying bats. And so the title of my talk, as you see, is the acoustic world of bats, sonar jamming, stealth, and silence. So I'd like to start by discussing actually a, a philosophy paper that was published in 1974 by uh, a researcher named Thomas Nagel. And this is quite old, but this was one of the most preeminent uh, and long lasting impactful papers of the 20th century. And Thomas Nagel, introduces this idea, this question of what is it actually like to be a bat? You know, we could imagine ourselves what it's like if we had wings and we could fly and maybe imagine what it's like to echolocate and sense the world around us through sound, although that's kind of hard to imagine. But Nagel argues from a philosophical perspective, ultimately, that it's impossible. You can't actually know what the bat experiences of the world around it. That was kind of the point of this paper. But uh, for me, I would argue it's still fun to try. And um, we can learn a lot by putting ourselves in the shoes of other animals, um, both about conservation, about neuroscience, about all sorts of different topics. So that's what I try to do as a scientist. And my goal for this talk is to give you an idea of, of what the world of a, of a bat is like and, and maybe what it is like a bit to be a bat. So I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of uh, this talk. I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of an introduction to bat acoustics, echolocation and the like. And then I'm gonna talk about three different research areas that I've been involved with. Uh, the first is bat-bat jamming. The second is stealth echolocation, and the third is bats flying entirely in silence. 
So I'll start with this high-speed video uh, that I recorded. This is recorded of a bat in a flight arena, and it's recorded all in infrared video, uh, so it's not affecting the bat. And we're recording the ultrasound or the, the sounds that the bats are making. Normally, we wouldn't be able to hear these sounds, but we've slowed everything down, so that drops the pitch of the sound, and we'll be able to hear the echolocation calls as well as see the bat flying. Okay, so hopefully you could hear those chirps. Those are the echolocation calls of a bat. Also uh, use that synonymously, synonymously with sonar. So how does echolocation work? Basically, we all have the basics of it, but I wanna boil this down a little bit more detail. So the bat is emitting a sound. Its sound waves are going into the environment, reflecting off of objects like moths or walls or trees. And it's hearing the echoes that are coming back. By comparing the sounds that go out to the sounds that come back, it's able to create an acoustic scene of its environment. In order to do this, it has to calculate three different aspects of the position of an animal. The azimuth, or the horizontal uh, di direction, the elevation, or the, the vertical direction, and the distance. So what's really unique about the bats is that ability to determine the distance to the sounds. And so our ears, most mammals, a lot of animals have very good directional sensing, but it's very difficult to tell how far away an object is with sound unless you're using echolocation. That's what bats are really good at. So if we visualize this, if we could record the sounds and put a little microphone maybe on the bat's head and record the echo that comes back, uh, scientists actually do this, then we could record the sound that goes out and the sound that comes back, the echo, and we could record the time interval, how long it takes for that sound to travel. And this is getting encoded into the bat's brain. All this is happening very quickly uh, and it's highly specialized for this task. So say it takes 10 milliseconds, that's one one hundredth of a second. Then the bat's brain will calculate using the speed of sound can convert that time delay, and there's technology, there's little devices you can buy at the hardware store that basically do this, and we'll convert that time delay, knowing the speed of sound, into a distance. So 10 milliseconds would equal 3.4 meters. All right, now I'm going to play another video here, and here the bat's going to be hunting insects, and I want you to listen carefully to the sounds that it's making, as well as watching what the bat's doing. Okay, so you can see that the bat is going to use its wing tip to grab onto the moth, flip it into its tail pouch, and then from the tail pouch into its mouth. So here it's actually going to do that whole thing, and then it tastes it and decides, nah, I don't like this one. And it's going to drop it. So you can see it's dropping it out of its tail pouch. It didn't like that one. So sometimes they can be picky eaters. Here it's gonna miss the moth just by a centimeter, a very small amount. It hits the moth with the forearm instead of into that soft membrane, flips the moth up into the air and the moth escapes. In this case, the bat is successful. It captures the moth, transfers it into its mouth. You're gonna see it flying along. It's got the moth into its mouth. It's gonna continue flying, eating that moth while it's flying. Um, and echolocating and breathing and doing all of this at the same time. So this is really an exquisite set of behaviors and this richness in front of you has really been keeping myself and my students and, and fellow researchers busy in our lab for some time to understand all that the bat is doing and how that it actually does it. All right, so hopefully you were listening to those sounds and noticed that the sounds that it was making when it was hunting the insects were different than the sounds that it was making when it was just flying along steadily. So hopefully you noticed that the sounds that are making, it was making them at a higher repetition rate. So there was cha 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 instead of bup, bup, bup. So you could think about why it would be doing that 
when it's hunting an insect. And the reason is that every time it makes a sound and gets an echo back, it's getting a snapshot of the environment around it. And by making those calls faster together, it's able to update its sonar screen more rapidly, getting that information um, that it needs in case the moth does a sudden dive maneuver at the last moment that helps the bat be able to track the movements of its prey just at the moment when it's needed. So we can actually visualize this using a technique called a spectrogram. And this is just, oh. <laughs> this is just taking a sound and converting it into a picture or an image. So what this is showing is on the x-axis is time in milliseconds. On the y-axis over here is frequency in kilohertz or thousands of cycles of, per second. So uh, to give you a perspective here, this whole event is about one third of a second. This is how long it takes to blink, literally blink an eye. And this is an entire attack sequence that I'm showing you. And our upper range of hearing for humans is somewhere around 20 kilohertz, which would be way down here at the bottom of the scale. All of the sound that's representing here is above our human range of hearing or in the range of what we call ultrasound. So if I play this for you, you can hear that sequence that that is calling and it calls faster and faster and faster until it gets to the end when it's making what we call a feeding buzz. Uh, if we played that in real time, it sounds like a bzzz. Uh, and so if you're out in the field, there's actually things called bat detectors you can plug into your phone and you hear that sound and you say, no, a bat is up there and it's hunting. Don't know if it caught something or not, but you know it's trying to capture something. All right, so this is a spectrogram. So there are over now actually 1,400 species of bats. I need to update my slide there. And about 70% of those are exclusively insect eaters. So most bats around the world are focusing on eating insects. So pretty much anywhere around the world, this map down here is showing the distribution of bats. And there's only a few places in the whole world where there's not bats, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and a few very remote islands. Even most islands have at least some bats. So pretty much this means if you are an insect out there flying around at night, it's very likely you have bats that are a big problem and that are probably one of your, if not your primary predator that you have to worry about. Now, insects are not helpless. Uh, in all of these insects that we're looking at here have independently evolved the ability to hear bats with specialized bat sensing, ultrasound sensing ears. And what's cool is that these ears show up all over the insect's body plant. So uh, up here on the left, let me see, I, I've got arrows showing it. Up here on the left is a lace wing. Uh, they actually have ears on the base of their wings. Um, various moths have them either on the, the back side of their body, the abdomen, or on the middle part of their body, the thorax. Uh, this is a praying mantis, and it has what we call a cyclopean ear, like a cyclops, because it just has one ear, whereas most of the other insects have two. Uh, crickets and katydids have them on their legs. Uh, these tiger beetles have them underneath uh, their elytra, these hard shells that they have. And these scarab beetles here have them basically on what's their neck. So this is really wild. It shows just how important this is. That This has evolved over 20 different times in different insect groups. So this is what it looks like, uh, an, a moth ear. So if you picked up a fuzzy brown moth uh, from your porch in the summertime and looked at its underside and put it underneath a microscope, this is the moth's eardrum or what we call a tympanum. And it looks very similar to our own eardrum. It's basically a very thin uh, piece of the insect's cuticle. It's stretched over kind of like a drum frame and it, it vibrates specifically to the frequencies that bats make. Now this is showing uh, a response of moths to bats when they get attacked. So when they hear those sounds, moths exhibit one of two different sets of behaviors. 
So this is showing a time-lapse image. So a camera was set out near a street light at night, up, up at the night sky, and it was open the shutter for a period of time to record the trajectories of uh, these moths and bats. So moth number one here at the top and moth number three over here on the right, they are hearing the moth, the bats echolocation calls, but the calls are pretty quiet because the bat is far away. So this is a signal to the moth to just flee, get out of the area, hopefully avoid any encounter at all. Moth number two here is not so lucky. This moth is hearing the calls that the bat are making. Those calls are coming fast and they're loud. And so this moth knows its life is in danger and it enacts evasion high level. So it starts spiraling, doing these spiral maneuvers, trying to throw the bat off of its trajectory. The bat is pursuing, it's turning, it's spiraling around. And at the very end of the sequence, the bat and the moth are very close to each other, but the camera shutter closes just before the moment of truth. So we don't get to see what happens here, but it's not looking good for that moth. So in addition to being, being able to hear uh, the bats, there are some moths that have an extra superpower, if you will, and that is the ability to produce sound of their own. And they do this, this is a group of moths called the tiger moths, which is one of the groups that I study. And they have this organ on the side of their body. It's uh, part of their body called the thorax. And that structure, we call it a timbal. So kind of think of the instrument, like a cymbal rhymes with timbal. And if we zoom in on this using a microscope, we can see this structure and it's a beautiful structure. This is a hollow uh, organ, it's filled with air. And on the surface, it has these series of ridges on it. And this is kind of like a musical instrument. To bend inwards. And it creates a series. Every time one of these little, uh, we call them micro timbals, every time one bends inwards, it creates an ultrasonic click that's at a frequency that bats can hear. And it does these at a very high repetition rate. So this was actually the subject of my PhD dissertation. I'm not going to go through all the science that we did, but I'm just going to kind of give you a high level summary uh, before getting into more detail of the research that followed. So the question becomes, why click? So why would insects, and I should mention that this structure, the, the moths use this sound almost exclusively as a defense against bats. And it's only in those last moments when a bat is coming in for the kill, the moth will make these sounds. So the question that scientists wonder about, including myself for a long time was why? And it turns out um, the main reason is that this is what we call a warning sound. The, the technical term is aposematism. And this is similar to why butterflies are brightly colored. Butterflies, as well as a lot of the moths that make these sounds, are poisonous or toxic to their predators. So as caterpillars, these moths feed on toxic host plants. They take those toxins into their body. They somehow have the ability to survive, and the toxins don't affect them, but it, it protects them against predators. And the sounds are a warning signal to their predators that the predator is not going to like what they found. Just like we saw in that video, the bat captured a moth and then dropped it. That moth was probably toxic, but, but it probably wasn't clicking. So by clicking, that is a signal to the bat not to eat them. Now, another main uh, question or hypothesis that, that scientists had for a very long time was what we call the jamming or the acoustic interference hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that the sounds are in some way directly interfering with the bat's echolocation processing. And this was um, actually the subject of my PhD dissertation and we showed uh, fairly convincing evidence. This was published in several scientific journals here to show for the first time that indeed moths can jam the sonar or echolocation of bats, uh, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool finding. So let me just show you this structure. We recorded it uh, using uh, high-speed cameras connected to a microscope, and you'll be able to hear the sounds that it's making. 
Okay, this is pretty wild. This is slowed down by 30 times and you can still hear how much sound it's making. These moths actually have two of them and they alternate. So when one is being quiet, the other one is making sound. Here, we're just listening to one, but you get an idea of just how much sound this is making. Okay, I, I think you get the idea. So basically the, the idea here is those sounds that the moth is making, if they time them just at the right time, they make this barrage of noise and this prevents the bat from being able to hear the echoes uh, that are coming back, or at least from being able to get the information out of those echoes that it needs to be able to figure out where the, uh, where the moth is. So this is showing a video of the jamming in action. And I'm not hearing the sound, um, but if you could hear the sound, we'd be able to hear the bat echolocating. The moth is making those jamming sounds. At the same time, the moth adds a little dive maneuver, making it extra hard. Uh, we also did experiments where the moths were tethered to a, basically hung from a fishing line. And even when the moths were hanging there on a fishing line, the bats still would miss time and time again. And um, we showed that that was correlated to uh, changes to the bat's echolocation ability. All right, so that's the intro or the background. And next I'm gonna talk to you about the first main research area um, that I'll go over in more detail, which is this idea that maybe bats are jamming each other. I just told you about moths that jam uh, bats, but could bats jam each other's echolocation? So this work uh, was done at the Southwestern Research Station in Southern Arizona. This is still a place I go back to every summer. And it's a wonderful, delightful place. Uh, it's, it's up in the mountains. And especially in the summer, we get these monsoon rains that come and the whole place turns green. It's literally what we call a sky island. So you drive up from the desert and there's saguaro cactuses and agave, and but mostly just desert around. You drive up into the mountain and there's all this vegetation. And so it's a magnet where there's all this amazing diversity of insects and bats and all sorts of other animals too. But those are the ones obviously I, I care about. So during my PhD, I was out there and I was uh, designing methodology so that we could study bats hunting insects in the field. And that really hadn't done, been done very much before. And so you can see here, there's an infrared camera in the field and we've kind of made our own little street lights out of ultraviolet or what they call black lights. These are lights that emit uh, wavelengths that attract insects. And very quickly you get these whole insects just flying all over the place. And then the bats learn this is where the party's at. And they start swooping in and you, you've got an incredible display of nature just happening right in front of you. So while this was happening, above my head, I was not even trying to study this just by accident. This is the beauty of studying animals in nature and animals that are generally not studied, at least not very well in some of these places is you stumble across things that nobody else has ever studied before. And this was one of them. And um, when I was going through my audio files, uh, this was actually back in the lab. I think it was this, I was at Wake Forest University in North Carolina at the time. I think it was December. I was going through audio files that we had recorded the summer before. And I saw these for the first time. I had never seen a call like this before. I'd been studying uh, the acoustics of bats for many years. So I was really surprised. I was immediately just grabbed my attention. So what you can see here, what, what stood out to me so much is that in this case, there's one bat uh, making fainter calls in the background. You can see these kind of sweeps, uh, especially over here. And it's doing a feeding buzz. And then another bat is making these squiggles uh, that are going up and down in frequency, up and down. And so I termed this a sinusoidal frequency modulated call or a sine FM for short, uh, because they oscillate with, with this really interesting pattern. And when I looked at it, you know, I had just been studying moths that jam the bats. And I thought, this is crazy. The bats look like they're jamming each other. 
uh, just the acoustics, the frequency is at the same time, and it's at the same time as a feeding buzz of another bat. It all looked like a jamming signal, but um, to my knowledge, nobody had ever proposed that bats jam each other uh, actively on, on purpose uh, before this. So uh, I, I looked at this one call and then I just thought, you know, it's, maybe it's just a coincidence. Maybe that was just kind of an odd thing that happened. But I went through the next audio file, a few down the line, and I saw it again, same thing. I, and I started looking for them. And I found five, I found 10, I found 50 of these things every single time, the same pattern. And I just thought this something really interesting is going on here. So I literally spent the next five years of my life studying this, getting funding uh, from the National Science Foundation, designing experiments. And uh, I'm summarizing that all up for you in about five minutes. So good bang for a buck here. So um, as one does with the scientific method, I tried to think of different hypotheses. What could be going on here? There's this jamming hypothesis. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe I can get some evidence for that. Maybe not. Or maybe uh, there had been other researchers who had shown that some bats make what were called food claiming calls. So this is basically one bat saying, hey, that moth is mine. Get out of here. Don't mess with me or I'll, 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 I'll chase you out of here. So it might still be sort of an aggressive signal, but it might not be actually disrupting the other bats at location. So those are my two main hypotheses. Um, there were others that I considered and tested. So how did I test this? So as I said, we, we spent quite a bit of time and, and effort into designing a, a method to study these bats. So the, the bats that were making these sound, I didn't mention this, they are a species of bat called Mexican free-tailed bats. And they live in massive colonies in California, Texas, uh, so on and so forth, and, and Arizona. The thing about these bats is they tend to fly very high up off the ground. So it was very difficult for me to catch them on uh, my normal camera setup. So instead, what I did is I went up to the bats and I built a two-story two scaffolding tower sort of an, my own observation deck to get up closer to the bats. And this is me up on the tower at night. And I've got a camera that's mounted onto a spotlight. And this took some practice, but eventually I got to the point where I could point this very bright but focused light at the bats and track them as they fly through the night sky. And I have a camera mounted on it so I could record video of them as they're hunting insects in the field and doing these behaviors. And I could see if the bats were actually capturing an insect or if the moth or whatever insect was getting away. Now, in addition, on the ground, I set up uh, what we call a microphone array. So this is um, eight microphones uh, that are set up on two sets of platforms here. And they're set up at very specific positions that, that are measured. And each microphone is recording the sounds uh, that the bats are making. Using this system and very subtle differences, kind of like how the bat echolocates, it's able to triangulate the position of the bat or multiple bats and make a map of the flight trajectories of the bats while they're doing this behavior. So by combining all this up, syncing it up, we can see where the bats are flying, what they're doing, and if they are more or less successful at capturing the moths when another bat is making these sine FM or potential jamming sounds. So this is showing the results. And we did this at two field sites. And this is natural. So when there was another bat nearby that were making these sine FM calls, this is showing the capture success um, in gray. The bats almost never caught their prey when there was another bat doing this. And it was much, much less likely that a bat would capture a moth when a, another bat was making these sounds compared to when there was not another bat making these sounds. So this confirms that it is some sort of competition signal because the capture success is going down. Um, this is one of the maps that I was telling you about, and this is pretty wild. So there's two bats and it's showing the time series. 
uh, the red bat comes in here, it does a feeding buzz, and at the same time, the blue bat does a sign FM call. The first bat misses, and then they basically take turns. They're going back and forth, two, three, four, five. I've seen this up to seven different times. They battle back and forth until finally one of them gives up. The blue one flies away, and the red one, in the end, was able to capture the moth. So this again is showing this is this extended competition in nature, which is, is pretty wild. So this is pretty, uh, this is supporting the jamming hypothesis, but so far I don't really have a bulletproof demonstration that it's actually jamming that's causing it. So I tried to do another experiment that could hopefully clearly show that this is in fact jamming and not just a bat saying, hey, that's mine something like that. So what I did is I designed another experiment. This was the following season. And this is kind of showing a diagram of our field setup. So this is a street light. This was done actually in a high school parking lot in Animus, New Mexico. Thank you to Animus High School, letting me work on your property, I had permission. And I, I took a fishing line again, and I strung it across. This is rather large uh, pole that I had. I basically run out there, I tie a moth to this line in the field, erect the other side of the pole, and amazingly, the bats would actually come in, swoop down, and try to attack these moths that I had tethered onto the line. When a bat comes in, I'm sitting there watching, and I've got a trigger that when a bat comes in, I've got to press the button to play different sounds back from a speaker that I have on the ground. And if everything happens right, it plays the sound, I record the video, and then I can see if the bat captures the moth or not. And to make a long story short, maybe not that short, um, this confirmed what we thought. So we tried this with lots of different sounds and different timing and only playing back the sine FM sounds, the natural sine FM sounds at the right frequencies and at the right time that prevented the bats from capturing the moths. But if we played other sounds or we played the sine FM sound too early, then the bats uh, were able to recover and actually capture the moths. So this was a clear demonstration that the bats are in fact jamming each other's echolocation, which uh, to our knowledge is the only case in nature of any echolocating animal uh, actively jamming the echolocation of another animal. So this was a, another really exciting finding. This was published in the journal Science in, in the year 2014. All right, so that was um, the, the first story I wanted to tell you in detail, and I've got two more that I want to go through, uh, assuming we have time here. The next one is uh, what we call stealth echolocation. So to provide you the context, context for this, uh, it's been thought for a long time that bats and insects have co-evolved. So co-evolution is a situation where you have evolutionary adaptation, in this case of a prey to the predator, and then it goes back and the predator evolves something in response to the prey, and often this goes back and forth, back and forth. So they're evolving together over time deliberately. Now, it's pretty clear that insects have evolved defenses in response to getting attacked by bats. I, I walked, we talked about several of them at the beginning of this talk. But there has been some debate in the scientific literature as to whether bats have specifically evolved strategies to overcome the insect's defenses. And that's really what's required if we want to honestly call this a co-evolutionary relationship, or we often call that also an arms race. So there's different ways that bats could be doing this. People have proposed, there's some bats that echolocate at a really high frequency. Uh, there's others that are at really low frequencies that the moths or other insects can't hear. It gives them an advantage so shouldn't that be considered coevolution? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Um, if it's truly coevolution, we need a bulletproof example that that is the reason the advantage that the bats are getting is the reason why it evolved in the first place. 
with higher or lower frequencies, they each provide a different advantage to the bats um, that it may have evolved for that other reason. So for example, higher frequencies reflect off of smaller objects. So that provides a more detailed scene for some bats. And it's possible the advantage that that provides could have just been a side effect. So that's not really good enough evidence to really say that this is coevolution. The one that has the best likelihood is what we call the stealth strategy or the stealth hypothesis. This basically just means that there's some bats that are echolocating very quietly, potentially to sneak up on the prey. And being quiet doesn't really give you much of an advantage in most situations. Um, bats will go quieter if they're flying closer to say vegetation or they're in the woods compared to the open. Um, but if you control for that and you could show that bats are being quieter than they need to be and they're gaining an advantage, they're better able to capture their prey, then that would be a clear demonstration of coevolution. So this is what I wanted to test. And in order to test this, I needed to um, answer a couple of questions. First of all, how loud are the bats being? And we need to control for different environments to make sure it's not the environment that's causing a bat to be quiet. And then second, how does stealth or bats being quiet affect the actual predator-prey interaction? So to answer the first question, uh, we again went out and we're basically fishing for bats, uh, not literally because there's no hook, but we uh, put a moth on a tether. And in this case, we have an ultrasound recording microphone that we stream down next to it. So we can record the sounds right at the position of the moth and not only measure how loud the bat is being, um, but also measure how loud it is as heard where the moth is. So we can figure out based on um, measurements if that's loud enough for the, to, the moths to, to hear it and exhibit those defenses that we talked about. So the results of this, we actually did this in the field as well as in a laboratory environment. And there was a huge difference. Uh, we did this for this bat here, my, my study subject, it's called Corynorhinus or Townsend's big-eared bat. And we did this for another bat, a uh, myotis bat, which is more typical species. And our potential stealth bat, Corynorhinus, was between 20 and 45 decibels quieter than the other species in exactly matched habitats. So they're definitely being quiet, even in the same habitat. Um, so we also did these experiments where we set up predator-prey interactions in a flight arena. And this is uh, our normal bat. So this is our control bat. Uh, and we're going to see a video. You, hopefully, you'll be able to hear the sounds that it's making. And watch this moth that I've circled right here. OK, moth is flying along. Should be able to hear the echolocation pretty soon. Boom, it does the feeding buzz. The moth does a nice diving maneuver, gets it out of the way, and the moth survives. It worked the way it was supposed to for the moth. Now, this is showing our potential stealth bat, Corynorhinus, and this is actually um, uh, our, our potential jamming moth. So we know that this moth will do a dive maneuver and make jamming clicks if it hears a bat coming. So what's going to happen? Watch the moth. The bat calls are so quiet, we can barely hear them. Bats flying in, swoops around, and it just goes up and scoops up the moth. The moth never even did anything. It never made any of the potential jamming sounds. It never did any diving maneuvers. And we basically just saw this time and time and time again with many different moths. And we repeated this with different individual bats. And we saw a very clear trend. So um, what we saw is the moths much, much less likely to exhibit any sort of diving maneuver or clicking sounds in response to attacks by our potential stealth bat compared to our other bat. And the capture success, the bats were also much more likely to capture the bats. 
but this comes at the cost of a reduced detection distance for the bats. So the quiet bats, because they're being quiet, their calls don't travel as far. And they only detect the moths at less than a meter away. So like maybe three feet away. This is really short distance compared to the other bat was detecting moths up to three meters away. So three or four times the effective range. So this is a trade-off. And this is often what we see in nature. You don't really ever get anything for free. Yeah, they're able to sneak up on their prey and they have a much more, much more likely they're going to capture the prey, but they can only sense the prey from closer to them. So their ability to find insects is going to be diminished. Um, but this did support our hypothesis. And I would argue this is some of the most conclusive evidence to date that this is in fact a co-evolutionary relationship um, and supporting these, these ideas. All right, we got through two of the three research sections in our intro. We just have one more section, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions. And this last topic is bats flying in silence. So this study, the studies I'm going to tell you about were done on hoary bats. And these hoary bats and Corynorhinus, not surprisingly, are my two favorite species of bats, people often ask me. And they are just absolutely gorgeous creatures. Sometimes people call them sky lions. Um, also, if you catch them in a net, that's how we catch bats. I'll show you some uh, video of that. They make absolutely ferocious noises. You can always hear, uh, you can tell when you have a hoary bat in the net because of the sounds that it makes. So they, they really are impressive creatures. They are also found uh, all across North and South America. And in addition, um, they are of particular concern uh, because they are the number one species in North America that are killed at wind turbines. Now, this is something also that we study in my lab, um, but for that, in that point as well, they're particularly of interest for conservation um, for scientists. Now, as I started this, I'm talking about these bats flying in silence or being quiet. And starting this out, anybody who knows about these bats and knows about echolocation would say, but wait a second, um, these aren't quiet bats. These are loud bats. There have been many, many studies, including my own master's thesis. I study these species. And they are known to fly in the open, be very loud. Um, so the potential that they're being quiet starting out, there's something different going on here. So the, where this research started was with my collaborator, uh, Ted Weller, who is a biologist with the US Forest Service up in Arcata, California. And he has been studying these bats in uh, redwood forests and riparian corridors in the fall, they migrate through in big numbers. And during migration, it's very hard to find these bats. This is one of, if not the only places in the whole North America, where you can find these bats in large numbers uh, during migration in the autumn when they're flying through. So he had been studying them for quite a while and putting up nets, catching bats, recording the sounds that they're making, and it was not adding up for him. He would have nights where he would catch 20 bats, but only have three recordings on his acoustic detector. So he was telling about this and I'm like, well, maybe your, your bat detector is broken, Ted. Um, but joking aside, he had seen many cases where he had actually watched bats fly right, right by his bat detector, which he has on the table in front of him at night, and they will circle him. Um, sometimes they get attracted. If you have a bat that you've captured, they'll be attracted. They'll circle him, and he was not recording any sounds. So he was convinced that these bats were flying without using echolocation or maybe just being super, super quiet sometimes. Um, which would be highly unusual. There's, there's no real cases um, other than what I'm talking about here of bats switching off their echolocation. So again, in order to study this, I went out to the field and we brought out our cameras, we brought out our microphones, and we tried to see what was going on. So we had some different experimental setups. We just recorded the bats, what they're normally doing as they're flying through this uh, forest riparian corridor. 
We also set up a mist net. So these big poles here are stretching across this very fine netting, which we use to catch the bats. So we wanted to see how they respond to this obstacle. And then we also played sounds back to the bats. We played echolocation calls to see how they would respond to it. We're just kind of trying to see some different variation, what the bats are doing and recording the response. So this is a video, again, I'm starting with a control species. So this is Myotis californicus, not the bat that we think is going quiet. And this is a recording of it in the fields. Hopefully you can hear its echolocation. It's just flying through, pretty boring recording of a bat flying in the forest at night, echolocating. Um, but what's cool about this is because we can reconstruct the flight with our video, in 3D, and we know the positions of the microphones, we can make a map and we can say, okay, if the bat is a certain distance away from the microphone and flying at a certain direction, then this is how far we should be able to pick it up. And this is how loud the bat is being. So this is a recreation. It's showing the bat, uh, each of our microphones. And every time we pick it up on a microphone, it's plotting it in red. If you don't pick up the bat on a microphone, it gets plotted in blue. So there's a couple over here as the bat is flying away from a microphone. Occasionally, we won't be able to pick it up. But we can basically figure out exactly how far a bat has to be away from our microphones before we can no longer pick up its echolocation. And so we did this with our hoary bats, and we did this for many different trials. And the, the end of the story is that we found that the bats are indeed doing three totally different things. They are making what we call the high intensity or their normal echolocation calls. These are the calls that they have been documented in many different studies. This is what they look like. They also make a new call type that had never been discovered before. We, we discovered this and call it a micro call. These calls are extremely short. They also are at very high pitch or high frequency and they're extremely quiet. So all of these things make these sounds uh, more like a stealth call. Uh, they have features that would make it difficult for a prey animal or another bat to be able to hear uh, this bat. In addition, we found cases and very strong evidence that the bats were in fact also flying in complete silence, not using echolocation at all. And this really counters 80 years of research on, on bats. Uh, the assumption has been that these kind of bats, at least, uh, microchiroptan bats in North America, have to use echolocation. This is the first case that anyone has ever found of um, the exception of fruit bats, which have big eyes uh, in Africa and, and places, that these kind of bats, we have always long assumed that they have to use echolocation, but turns out that they don't. Um, so I will show you some videos of, of the bats actually switching on their echolocation. So here's a bat flying in to the mist net. It's being quiet. And then right there, it starts doing a series of chirps right before it crashes into our net. So somehow it detected that net. It may have been doing micro calls. Maybe it saw it visually or somehow else. And it turned on its normal echolocation um, right before crashing into the net. Um, we saw this nine out of 12 captures of the bats, the same pattern happened. So it was consistent response. In addition, we saw a number of events of the bats turning on their echolocation in response to another bat. So in this case, there's going to be two bats. Both of them are going to be quiet at first, and then they both turn on their echolocation. Okay, here's bat number one. It's flying up on top. Bat number two is in the bottom. It's kind of in the shadows. That one turns on its echolocation, starts chasing the other one. The other bat has been found, so it turns on its echolocation, and then they just chase each other, echolocating, going along their way. That was a little bit of bat profanity. Okay, and we saw this same thing. Every single case, 13 different trials we recorded where there was an interaction between two bats, the same exact pattern happened every time. So there are a number of questions. Uh, this clearly, we clearly demonstrated the bats were turning off their echolocation, also making these stealth micro calls, which 
you know, this is bizarre behavior for bats. Nobody's ever seen this before. So could it be a predatory strategy? Could they be quiet to sneak up on their prey like the other bats um, that we're studying? Well, we don't think so, especially them going silent. Uh, these bats fly much faster than the other bats that I told you about. And they're just being too quiet to be able to sneak up on prey. We never saw one of these bats attacking an insect in any of these studies. It seems much more likely that this has to do with interactions between bats. Maybe it's kind of a mating strategy for sneaking up on mates, or it could be a way to avoid um, unwanted attention from other bats. So we see a lot of this aggressive behavior, and maybe it's a way to avoid getting other bats' attention that you don't want. Um, this also brings in a lot of other questions. How are they getting around? How are they detecting the environment? Are they using vision? Bats actually have pretty good vision. So maybe they could use some combination of vision as well as what we call spatial memory. That's just, they have a map of the environment in their brain and they can kind of remember where they are going if they have already been in that area before. So um, I'll just very quickly tell you a quick follow-up um, because it, I'm really happy with the results. I know we're about out of time. It's been a long hour, but bear with me uh, because I got a, one more cool little snippet to tell you as a follow-up. Um, as I mentioned, hoary bats are killed um, at huge numbers at wind turbines. We're trying to figure out uh, the reasons why, and hopefully some of this kind of work eventually could help us figure out why bats are getting killed and um, what we could do to prevent those. So uh, to follow up on the study that I told you about, we wanted to get what we, I'm calling a bat's ear view of what's going on. So what we did is we caught the bats and we had these tiny little uh, microchips that we could put on the bats that would record the sounds that the bats make in the field, wherever they go, and it has a little accelerometer. So this measures the movement patterns of the bats. And we put that on the bat, let it go. And this records all that data onto the chip, but we have to get it back because the data is on that little chip. So we put it on with a tiny amount of glue that eventually hopefully falls off of the bat in a few days. We also have on the back, a little radio transmitter that's sending out a signal. And we send out an aerial telemetry pilot, and we had a whole crew of, uh, of ground people looking for signals. So we put out these on the bats, and we actually were able to recover 13 out of 30 of these tags we put on the bats, which to me was remarkable. And we could study all that was going on. Um, I don't have time to go through all of it, but this did again confirm the bats are flying completely without echolocation. Um, when they were making their normal echolocation, they so what we saw is they tend to switch behaviors. Either they were echolocating and making these feeding buzz buzzes, so they're in this kind of feeding and echolocating mode, or they were being quiet, being silent, making micro calls, and we saw the acoustic events of these social interactions or maybe anti-social interactions, you wanna call them. So this is further evidence that this behavior is more of a bat-bat behavior. They're, they're being quiet or being silent to avoid um, other bats. And in order to capture prey, they have to echolocate. And that makes sense based on what we know about echolocation. So returning to this question of what is it like to be a bat? Well, I hope that you've learned something tonight. Um, and we have uh, a little bit more appreciation for the behaviors that bats are doing. And it's crazier than I think anybody could have really imagined even 20 years ago. To be a bat means you're perceiving the world around you with sound, and that has surprising implications. It means that insects, your prey, can hear you from 100 meters away and can jam your echolocation. It means that competitors are out there also ready to jam you, and you have your own strategies to counter that. So this is really one of the most complex, one of the most fascinating co-evolutionary relationships I think that, that we know about in, in science. And it's really been my pleasure to get to study this and obviously my pleasure to share this with you all. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, I do wanna thank, this has certainly not been a one person endeavor by any means. Um, all of this work has been done with numerous 
uh, students, collaborators at many institutions, and I want to thank all of them um, and my funding sources and would love to take some questions. Hi, uh, yes, thank you so very much for your talk. I definitely learned a lot today um, and just super excited to hear everything that you did. Um, so I do have a couple of questions from the chat. <laughs> um, yeah. So one of them was saying um, the bats that you had mentioned are they considered are they considered endangered species, and if so, are there any um, enclaves that protect them? Yes. So um, none of the species that I um, have studied are endangered as far as federal protection, um, but. Uh, the Townsend's big-eared bat that I studied is a species, what's well, called a species of special concern. So that's kind of, it goes species of special concern, then threatened, then endangered. So basically, if the populations get any worse, then they would become either threatened status or endangered. Um, but fortunately, they're not um, that that off, but it's definitely a species that, um, that state agencies and uh, conservationists are are worried about. Hoary bats are very common and widespread. Unfortunately, with the wind turbine situation, a number of scientists at Bat Conservation International and colleagues have done modeling. I mean, the numbers are staggering here. There's over 100,000 deaths every year at wind turbines. And a large number of those, probably about half of those, are this one species, hoary bats. So people have done projections to say, if this continues at the rate that it is, in about 30 years, uh, they could either be endangered or close to extinction. So they're not there now, but the threats are real. And if we don't do something about it, they very likely will be in the not so distant future. Uh, the other question was, um, will the bats, will these bats be able to fly high to be impacted or are filled by offshore wind turbines? Yeah, good, great, great questions. Um, there is some idea that the bats that tend to fly higher are impacted at wind turbines more often because the wind turbines are up high. So the bats that do get killed more at wind turbines tend to be the ones that fly in the open and fly higher up. Um, whereas like Townsend's big eared bat, they just keep down close to the ground. They never really travel away from vegetation or, or from close to the ground. So it's very unlikely they would get up into the airspace and get killed there. Um, or offshore wind is a whole different question. And the answer there is we just don't know. Um, nobody has really gone in offshore environments to know if bats are there. Um, it's quite possible, but I, to my knowledge, there's not really any good data to answer that. So unfortunately, offshore, there's not going to be any carcasses to raise the red flag. So if they build them and things are getting killed out there without monitoring, without thermal video or other tools to know that it's even happening, there's no evidence of that it that it's going on. So that's that's frightening. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of curious um, because um, so obviously like the especially like the hoary bats are the ones that are getting uh, the most impacted with the um, with the turbines. But um, would it be possible to put like maybe like an uh, some sort of like echolocations in these turbines to kind of like tell the bats it's like, hey, as like as a warning sign, like don't come near here. It, it, would that be some sort of possibility? Yeah, we can have a whole nother talk that's all about wind turbines. <laughs> that's actually like the whole other half of my lab right now. And I have three grant proposals in right now that are related to this question. And it's they basically have two options for uh, preventing the bats from getting killed at the wind turbines. Um, the one that has the best success, the only way that we know to prevent deaths at wind turbines right now is what's called curtailment. And that just means when it's really low wind conditions, um, the wind turbines are actually not producing hardly any, in some cases, no energy production. That's actually when the deaths are happening of these bats. 
So there's a bit of a trade-off there. If you could just shut the turbines off at low wind conditions when the turbines are not producing much energy, then you can pre prevent like somewhere around half or two thirds or more of the deaths of the bats. Unfortunately, there is a little bit of energy loss. So even that small amount, of course, you know, you don't want to not have energy production from these things. And it's hard to, to, to lose money, but we need more regulations probably in place to, to, to enforce that. The other strategy is um, called a deterrent, and that would be any way just to keep the bats away from the turbines. And people are studying lots of different and proposing different ways that we could do that from playing sounds um, to deter the bats. Unfortunately, that's pretty hard because these turbines are so huge that it's hard to play broadcast a sound that's going to tr propagate or travel far enough in the environment to actually keep the bats away from the whole thing. Um, so people are looking into things like um, very dim ultraviolet light that flickers that might keep the bats away. If we could maybe like paint the turbines a different color, um, we're, people are trying all sorts of different things or, or looking into all sorts of different things to try to keep the bats away. Awesome. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Dr. Corcoran? I don't want to take up all of the, the, the time. <laughs> um. Hi. Um, is it appropriate to just ask a question over the mic? Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm Aaron. I was just wondering, um, with regards to the um, bat on bat jamming behavior that you observed, I was just wondering if there was any difference in the um, sort of frequency, not in terms of like the sound, but in terms of how often it occurs between um, interspecies as opposed to intraspecies competition. And then a follow-up question to that would be, have you, are you aware of any instances where a resident population of bats will have developed a strategy of disruption against a rival population, um, population's hunting period. Yeah, cool ideas. Um, thanks for the questions, Aaron. The first question is that, um, to our knowledge, this is only a, a thing that happens between Mexican free-tail bats. So it's only intraspecific. Um, it's possible it could happen between bats of different species, and there's one published paper showing that that could be a possibility, but usually um, in nature, intraspecific competition, competition within the own species is usually higher than competition between species because they share all the same behaviors, they feed on all the same prey, generally speaking, and so most of the natural selection is going to be, be aimed at competition. This is particularly the case for Mexican free-tail bats, which have colonies of upwards of a million bats. If you think about it, you have to go out and fight with a million other bats that you roost with to find enough food every single night. So the competition within the species is very high. Um, and then as far as other things like rival groups of bats and things like that, I would love to know the answer, but we just don't have any data um, on that. So we don't know the relationships. It's, it's very difficult to um, track these bats. Theoretically, it is possible, as you've seen, we are getting smaller and smaller devices so we could put like many GPS tags on these bats and figure out their social networks and whatnot. But the reality is, especially for bats that are so dense, it'd be very difficult to answer that kind of question. Any other questions? Well, I'm sure I had one question in mind, but I just can't remember <laughs> anymore. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question. Uh, it's rather quick. When you mentioned the tiger moths and they're clicking, is it only the Arctic tiger moths that have developed this um, behavior? Or do you know of any other insects that have done this independently? Uh, great question. So my colleague, Jesse Barber, who's at Boise State, has shown there are certain 
groups of hawk moths that jam bats with their genitals. Hmm. Only That's the males. Interesting. Well, the males awesome. Thank you. Have these uh, genital claspers. And they rub them together, and it has multiple functions. It's uh, used in in mating as well as in jamming bats. Those are, the only, those are the only groups that we know of, but it's probably evolved many times in tiger moths. Tiger moths are a huge group. There's like 10,000 species. Uh, so there's been some efforts to try to map this onto the family tree and see like how often does it evolve? How did it evolve? All those sort of questions. Any other questions? I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you. That was an awesome talk. And I learned a lot of things that I had no idea about. I'm so glad to hear that. Thanks for staying up late. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, I feel like I learned something new every time <laughs> on these talks. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. There's so much cool science going on out there. And unfortunately, most of the time, people don't necessarily hear about it. So thanks for the opportunity to share this with folks. Yeah, I got to say, I really enjoyed hearing about the bats jamming each other. Um, that was very interesting to, to hear about because I would have never thought that bats did something like that. Like I said, I wouldn't have either. I mean, the moth jamming thing, that actually goes back to 1965. There's a paper that talks about that as a possibility. It just, nobody had done the experiment to really test it. Uh, but with the bat jamming, I had never even heard that proposed as a hypothesis prior to the work that I talked about. So that was pretty wild. Yeah. Okay, so if there isn't any more questions, um, I really like to thank you for coming today. Um, we definitely learned a lot. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys um, got to enjoy learning more about talks and got to um, be with us today on Bat Appreciation Day. Um, and hopefully next year we'll have like an awesome talk. Uh, <laughs> they got to they top you off. <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> oh, and um, you can check out my website uh, if you want to follow up with contact or there's more information there, sonarjamming.com. Okay, awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And I hope you guys have a lovely rest of the, the night. <laughs> Thank you.